learn a few different types of reactions. Um, there, it's very simplified. Some parts I don't necessarily, it's not how I would always teach it, but we'll, it'll give you enough that you can kind of predict products. So that's the idea. Does that make sense? Like you guys have to know how to, if I told you a name, you could write a structure, right? And if I said, okay, I'm going to react magnesium carbonate plus sodium sulfate, you would probably go, okay, but I don't know what's going to make. You with me? So what we're going to do is I'm going to teach you a few fundamental things. Now, at this point, you have learned a few. Just to remind you, you actually have learned some of these. You've learned that any hydrocarbon, when it burns, right, what's it really reacting with? Oxygen. And the products are? Carbon dioxide and water. And a little bit of? that incomplete have carbon monoxide and water so both happen at the same time I don't know if everybody was catching that part but what you do is you add more oxygen that favors the complete combustion which is safe if you start to pull oxygen out of it it goes down to the incomplete combustion which is the dangerous carbon monoxide reaction that's why when your car starts running ragged or your burners at the house or whatever are kind of not getting oxygen properly, they start to burn improperly and can be a hazard. Hence, we got carbon monoxide detectors. Yes? And I also just give you this practical advice. If I look at a flame and it's burning with more incomplete, bad, what does it look like? Yellow, orange, right? But if it's burning clean, it looks blue, and that's generally true for <coughs> hydrocarbons. Okay? So, that was kind of that. We also did a couple other simple ones. Um, I mean, they look complicated because they're organic reactions. Right? We said, hey, you could take an alkene, which means what when I say alkene? Double bonds are involved. You can treat it with a catalyst and some hydrogen, and it will turn into alkane. It just, it, it, takes, removes the double bond and just puts hydrogen across it, right? And that's what we call hydrogenation. We, we're able to put hydrogen across double bonds. And that happens with fats, right? We take cis fats, we hydrogenate them, they become saturated fats. What that means is usually when you see it is it comes from liquid to solid, right? So that's kind of more complicated, but that's kind of it so far, right? So we're gonna learn a few more today. When you were with me, we had these solubility tables. Does anybody have those with? Anybody miss that? I got a few extras if you want hanging out with me last week. We got salt and bath too. Yeah. Salt and bath. What? Oh, everybody's looking at me like, oh. What was it on? It just, um, it was just sitting there by the when you checked in. Oh, I just. Talked. It's okay. I mean, I, I hopefully I got enough. But I'll pass out what I got. Here we go. Anybody else? Good. I guess we got it covered. Yay. Got it? Okay. So this is going to be one sheet that you would have available to do this because you can't necessarily memorize this. I can show you a piece of it though. I'll show you. It's an easier, it's, it looks complicated, but it's actually fairly easy to kind of memorize all the parts on there. <coughs> but let's just kind of introduce this just generally, just generally. Okay, these are two general ways of thinking about it. It's either you put things together, composition or combination reaction, or you take things apart that's decomposition. That's the really simple way to start. But when you look at a chemical 
balanced equation and say, oh, are, are things really getting put together or, or taken apart? It can be a little complicated unless you just think of it this way. When I say put things together, I mean if I looked at something on this periodic table and it combined with something else on that periodic table, it made something that's a, a molecule. So here's where you have to be a little careful. There's some things, as you find them on the periodic table, they already come in a molecule form. What are those? Ions. What? It's the diatomic ones, right? Which one are they? those? Help me out. Any diatomic? 7, N, O, F. Oxygen, I heard something. Okay. Uh, yeah, this right here, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, right, and hydrogen. So just for example, I mean, and I'll, I probably have that up here, I don't know. But, you know, this is, I'm just trying to show you symbolically, right, it just looked like this. If I had two fundamental elements, although this could be a molecule already, if it's hydrogen, it could be H2, right? So let me just show you. I could put a couple things together. That, do you see? I obviously took some things apart to get there, but it's just like, hey, oh yeah, these are fundamental elements. They're diatomic off the table. They somehow got combined into a compound. That's con considered a combination. Easy enough? So that's the only subtle kind of, you know, it's real easy when you have something that's not like that. Like you have something very... Right? It's like element, element, compound, combination. Easy? Is everybody with me? No? No? Just why that's a little tricky. You gotta think, you gotta, it just, it's, it fundamentally came off the element table, got combined with something else off the table, and made a new compound. That's all there is to it. Now, the next part I want you to be aware of, though, is I want you to learn to balance equations. So we're going to practice that within this skill set. And the way that is, is <clears throat> very beginning of the year, we, we, knew, we learned how to count atoms and stuff, right? So we kept, when we get in here, how many atoms are sitting here? Two. How many are Two. So I actually have two hydrogens coming in, and on the product side, I only have how many? One. That's a problem. That's kind of like <coughs> where the atoms go, right? It's called the, the technical term of that is conservation of matter. Matter is never created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction, right? But that's kind of what it's saying. So all we do to balance that, to make sure water is not ever, or matter is never lost, is we can put numbers in front, right, so I don't lose atoms. And what I always instruct you guys to do is start on the left, come to the first number that's wrong, hey, two here, one there, fix it by putting a number in front. Not a subscript, a coefficient in front. Because it's still HCl. I just have two of them. And that would make sense. Two H's, two chlorines could break apart and make two HCl's instead of just one. Right? This guy, is it alright? As written? Yeah, it's fine. It just follows conservation matter. So it's balance. And that's, this is a very easy combination reaction. Okay? Now I'll see how my examples are. Yeah, see, here's one. This is rust. I'm just making rust. Like an iron coat hanger hits oxygen in the room and it makes rust. Yeah? But can you look on this side and say, okay, I, I had a fundamental atoms. There's the O2 piece because it's the diatomic. When I get to the other side, I got this big molecule. So that's just a combination. That's all I want you to learn. Very simple. Now we go in and balance, though. This isn't okay, right? Somebody help me. What should I start on the left? Two, I hear that, okay? See how I did? <clears throat> Keep going, what do I put here? Yeah, that's a little hard, huh? So one way you can fix that is, what times two gives you three? 1.5, so you can put a 1.5 and then that would be correct to, to start with. I don't know if I did it this way on my PowerPoint, but I'll just kind of get you used to this. This is a good technique to get these balanced when they're kind of complicated like this. You guys start off with two, that's good. You got over here to make this right, I'm going to put a 1.5. It's all balanced, correct? 
So sometimes what we do is we just put it in whole numbers to make us sleep at night that we don't have fractions in there. It doesn't matter. Actually, there's stuff we do later where we leave fractions in there. It doesn't matter. I mean, I could have one and a half moles of something. Right? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. There's billions of them. I could take one and a half of those instead of just one. Right? But if you want to just make it whole numbers all the way through, you multiply by whatever makes this a whole number. So I'll multiply all the way through by 2. 4FB302. See what I did? I just multiplied all these numbers, 1 by 2, 1 and a half by 2, 2 by 2, and it made whole numbers, and now it's balanced correctly. And that's an easy way to balance, as easy as it gets. So everybody okay with that? Okay, a little bit? You give me the scrunchy face, but you understood what I did here to make it match. Is that okay? So far so good or no? What part's bothering you? Uh, this thing here? Yeah, there's a two on the iron. Right? And a one and a half on the oxygen. And a one on this, really. Correct? So the idea is to get rid of this fraction. If I multiply this by two, it'd be a whole number. And that's okay if I multiply everything by two. Two times two is four, one and a half times two is three, one times two is two. And then these are all whole numbers and they work because there's four ions, four irons, six oxygens, six oxygens, perfect. You can, I just, unfortunately, because I give you that multiple choice tests and quizzes, you don't know what you'll see. Is it wrong? No, absolutely. We use that a lot in chemistry. So, like, if we had to type it in, and we might not get very good. Yes. <laughs> if I catch it, then you might have to make sure I catch it. But yeah, it would work. I'm, I'm not going to argue. Yeah. Why would you multiply by two? Yeah, because some people it bugs them that they're not whole integers. I wish I could give you. It's. No, no, no. It'd be whatever it would take to get rid of the fraction. So if I had a 1.33, I just multiply the whole thing by three. Yeah, you have very most of the examples you'll have will be something as simple as this. Um, I, it's, these aren't complicated balances that I'm looking for. Is that good? So oh, I did do that. Good. Just so you can practice when you run the slides, you can remind yourself. Yeah. So the two applies to both um, iron and oxygen, right? Yeah, so what happened was, I, if I do anything to this, I got to do it to the whole thing because it's balanced, right? So it's just like saying, hey, I got, I got two of these and one and a half on this side, and it's equal to whatever's hanging out on this side. That's what that means, right? So if I multiply this by two and multiply this by two, they're still equal. And that's the whole idea is that you can, balance, you can multiply all the way through an equation with any number. It'll still be correct. Okay, little trick there. This one, I don't know. I, you know, this is harder for me to see, and I don't know that I would ask you this because, in some ways, you know, it was a fundamental element, correct? It did get attached to, to this, but this had to break apart in order for that to happen, and this one broke back down to a fundamental element. So that's kind of a little like ant. But the idea, if I'm thinking about combining reactions, I would say, well, this zinc did build some stuff onto the end of it to make a compound. That's the combination part of it. Okay, so I'll be careful with this. I don't like that question after I got it up here. I was like, eh. This one, though, we're going to talk about first. We're going to spend a minute with this. These are very subtle because, in essence, I can't see the combination unless I pay very close attention to the states. Because as far as this goes, this is a compound, this is a compound, these just traded places. So I might go, well, why is that a combination reaction? Right? That's kind of, what? Unless I understand states and solutions like you just went through. And then I would go, wait a second. 
this isn't sodium hydroxide, it's sodium, it's in solution, so it's kind of like just floating around in the water. See what I'm saying? Th this means this floating around in the water. Correct? This means this is floating around in the water. And then I have three of these. They're all floating around in the water. Correct? And I get to the other side, if these were all floating around the water, nothing happened. There is no reaction, there's no combination, nothing happened. But I see this happen. Oh wait, that made a solid compound. That's called a precipitation reaction. And we started the class off with this concept earlier. I said, hey, sometimes you take two clear fluids, you put them together and a powder falls down. You're like, whoa, there's some chemistry going on. That is actually a combination reaction. It's saying ions that were in solution make a solid. To simplify it down, to see it, I would just go, hey, I, too, I have two aqueous rea reactants, aqueous salt, aqueous salt, and I make a solid precipitate combination reaction. Also called the precipitation reaction. Just, that's what we call it technically in chemistry precipitation reaction. It's a very important reaction because it's kind of how all your water's cleaned up. They take a hydroxide, they make it a little, the water a little basic, and you kind of hits a heavy metal, it just falls out, so you're not drinking heavy metals. And then the salts that are left behind are usually not that bad for you. And your tap water is pretty salty for that reason. Everybody with me? See what you're looking for? You have you made that in your notes? You're basically looking for aqueous salt. Aqueous salt makes it precipitate. That's the key on this one. I would study these two because that's the ones I'd really like you to focus on. It's obvious I got two atoms, something off the table that came together and made a bigger compound. That's a combination. The other one is the precipitation. That's a combination. Those are your two go-tos. Okay, yeah, oh, this is good. We can practice. Ready to get it balanced up? How are we doing? Sodium okay as I start? Left to right? Sodium okay? Yep, good. Hydro now, keep your polyatomic ions together. It makes it easier. Do I have enough hydroxides? No, how many do I need? Three. So that restarts this, puts a three in front. See how I do that? Then that then means, okay, if that's three, what do I have to do over here? Follow? I think you guys gotta kind of see the process, right? I start in, I go. All right, I'll put my number. That's good, sodium's fine, good. Hydroxide, not okay, so I gotta fix it. Follow? Now I restart. I just I always restart. Once I change one of these numbers, I just go to the front and start all over again. All right. Sodium right? No, nope, not quite. I'm gonna fix it. Now let's go back. How are we doing? Sodium okay? Yep. Hydroxide okay? Yep. Iron okay? Mm -hmm. One and one. Three chlorides? Mm -hmm. Three chlorides? Mm -hmm. Three chlorides? We're done. That's the process. Good stuff, that's a balanced equation. And the recipe says, look, if I want to, by the way, precipitation reaction, it says if I want to precipitate the iron out of this solution, I gotta have three of these for every one of these. And that's what the chemistry says. Good stuff? All right, one down. Let's talk about this a little more. We're going to drill down on this precipitation reaction. Get your sheet out, because this is what we're going to teach you how to do this. <clears throat> to identify. 
identify this like you're identifying, you're looking for two ionics, two ionic salts in, in water coming together. Okay? And then just to kind of put some visualization on it, I'm going to just remind you. Uh oh, this one didn't quite get there yet. I was about to tell you. Ionic salts in water, they look like something, you know, it's a clear solution of some sort. That was a good example. Well, that didn't quite get mixed. I just do that, and that powder goes into solution. Right? It's going to kind of disappear from the liquid, right? So when I see an ionic salt aqueous up there, see that like Ki aqueous? It looks like this. But sometimes, if there's, you know, it's just a dissolved solution, it's a clear solution. Okay? Um, sometimes, I'll take one that you can pass around, just so you know. This is, we'll do the simple one. This is good old table salt, right? So that's sodium chloride. You can pass that around. Get the cap on. Just table salt. So no biggie. But quite often when you take a metal and put it in there, it's still in solution, but it's kind of colorful. That's cool, huh? So that's iron in solution. Does that make sense? So what we know is sometimes you mix those and some a powder comes down. Right? And that's that's a precipitation reaction. <clears throat> so what I want to teach you, because remember what the goal is today. The goal is, could I predict what I make? That's the, the idea. So I say, hey, put any two salts together, and I'll tell you whether it does this or not. That chart's going to help you do that. That's the whole goal. All right, so here we go. I'll kind of see if I can get you through this little routine. And here, here's how you know what's happening. Because if you put them together, you see a powder. So it's like, oh yeah, it's definitely happened. But I'd like to know which one fell down and which one stayed in solution. Right? Because really, this thing, nothing happened to these. These are called spectators. Before, potassium was floating around in the water, kind of like that, right? It's a K plus. An I minus was floating around in water. This lead was floating around in water. Nitrates were floating around in water. That's what that means, right? And that's what we worked on the last time. I could figure out how many moles are dissolved in a liter. It's molarity. If I could tell you how many uh, grams were dissolved in 100 mils, right? That's that percent by mass per volume, like you guys use in medicine and your trade. And if I told you PPMs, right, that would tell you how many, anybody help me with that? Milligrams, right, per one liter. Yeah, there you go. That's what a PPM is. Okay, so that's that business. They're all floating around. This is still floating around. Nothing happened. Potassium didn't do a thing. Nitrate didn't do a thing. Why do I put them together? So that they balance. I need that for, for my other calculations. You called it an observer? Yeah, I call it a spectator. spectator. That's, what, that's what we should call it. Those are called spectator ions. Don't, not doing a thing. But the business end is this. Oh, the lead just falls down. Okay. All right. Thank you. So here we go. Now, why are salts precip precipitating? Just so you have it in your head, because remember what we talked about earlier. Water, OH, right, has what kind of charge in it that makes it want to grab things? You're like. Beach somewhere. I have to come home. I know. Me too. It took me a minute to get here. What, what's in water that makes it want to bond to things? Like I'm drawing them like this. There you go. It's a hydrogen bond, right? So water has hydrogen bonds, and that will make it grab these ions, and it can break them apart and kind of pick them up in water. Correct? So this isn't completely done, but this is correct. That that negative into water would grab the leads try and lift them up. The positive ends would flip over and try and grab the iodines. Flip that, you know, lift it up. If I could surround them, they would stay in solution, correct? But what happens with these is lead is highly charged and it's very dense. It has a lot of mass. And so what it does is this glob, I just can't get enough waters around it. So it's insoluble and it falls out of solution. Okay? So like it's just trying to dissolve it, but it can't do it, so it just falls down. And that's the precipitate you're seeing. So 
so the key to things that precipitate are highly charged, right? That's kind of the key to it. Plus two, plus three, minus two, minus three is more realistic. Things that are charged minus one, plus one tend to usually be soluble. That's just a big general rule of thumb. I'll show you how to walk on this table here in a minute. Okay, now let's get used to using this table a little bit and I'll show you how this works. But does that make sense? What basically the model, like how this is happening, why water can't get that? Because remember, this is a true charge. This is strong. It's a minus one. This is a partial charge. This is like 120 volts. This is like 9 volts. In reality, this is like 100 kilojoules, and this is only like 10 kilojoules. So it's 10 times stronger attachment here. So the only way I could get this apart with these is if I got a lot of them around this. And that's always true, right? I can only dissolve, and you saw it a minute ago. If I, if I don't surround a salt with enough water, it won't start picking it up. And I had to get it surrounded, didn't I? And then up it went. This, you can never get enough waters around it. There's just not enough room. It's like if we all went out in the parking lot and said, hey, we're going to start lifting the car. Let's do it. So we all get on a different part of the car, but we can't get enough of us around. Right? And so we never can get that car lifted. But if you could get enough people around it, you could lift that car. Right? So that's kind of the idea. All right, so that's enough of that. Now I'm going to show you how to use the table. So look at the table. And I'm going to teach you how to do this. Let's, let's look at the big picture first off. The top part are soluble compounds. These are generally soluble compounds. So my goal is I want to look at this. I'm going to go back here and just show you a balanced equation. It's in here. It's written for you. But if that wasn't written, here's what I want you to be able to read. Can you look at that compound on this table and tell me whether it's soluble or not? Can you look at this compound on the table and tell, you, tell me whether it's soluble or not? If one of them is insoluble, that means there's a precipitation reaction. Now, the nice thing getting from here to here, you ready? From here to here, just trade the metals. Just trade the metals. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that's the starting point. So here we go. I'm gonna put a couple of these up to show you how, how you could just predict. You guys can call out any salt. Any salt you can think of. It's any ionic compound. Take a metal on metal. Just call it out to me. What do you got? What? Iron. And then what's the non-metal you want to stick on there? It's up from the right hand side of the table. Nitrogen. Okay. So we got some sort of iron nitride. And I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna do something you guys might be familiar with. So I got iron nitrate. And I'm going to hook it together with, let's say, interact with sodium um, sulfate. There you go. Is that okay? All I'm telling you to begin with is let's figure out if the things we make are insoluble, but to get there, you just trade the metals. Okay? So now it's sodium nitrate. See how I traded it? sodium nitrate and iron sulfate. So I go over here and I go, okay, sodium nitrate. The nice thing is I got to, you got to pay attention to your charges. Sodium's plus one nitrate. You have to figure your polyatomic ion table out and you go, oh, that's a minus one. So that's one to one. You trade this other one off and you go, whoop, that's a little tougher. That's an iron three and a sulfate two minus. Who can help me with that? What number should go down here? Two. What number should go down here? Oh, three. Good. There you go. Then the question is, is one of these insoluble? If so, you've got a reaction. If no, there's no reaction. That's how you do that. But the first part is do the trade. Okay? Now, the next part, you would balance it. If you said, oh yeah, there's a reaction, you'll balance it. But let's not work on that yet. We'll get there in a minute. Let's just do another one just so you get this feel of this. I'm going to do calcium chloride 
and sodium carbonate. Okay. You ready? Anybody over here tell me one of the things I'm going to make? Sodium chloride. Sodium chloride. Yay. Does everybody see how she did that? Just did this change with that. That would put sodium on the chloride end of things. Correct? Okay, somebody over here, can you give me the other side? What's the other one? Just move that over there. Calcium carbonate, perfect. Then you just clean it up with charges. You know, if it takes you a minute, that's okay. Is this okay, one to one? Yep. This one? Is that okay? Yep, we're done. Now we're gonna just, okay. Everybody get the first part? That's the switch. It's called a double displacement reaction if you're trying to be real fancy. You break, it's, it would be Na2Cl2, but because that's, that's. Yeah, yeah, both so. Both those, we the, can get rid of them. Yeah, so she's jumping ahead to the balancing, which I appreciate. If I did want to get it right now with the balancing, I'd start left to right and go, calcium's not right, uh, calcium's fine. Chloride's not, so you got to go over here and fix it, correct? Chloride's right, sodium's right, carbonate's correct. That's a balanced equation. Yep. And if we want to do this one, same thing. My iron's not right, correct? What should I put in front? Two. All right, cool. My iron's fine now. Looks like a lot of nitrates. How many? Holy mackerel. There's two times three, six. So we're gonna just fix it. And then just keep going. All right. How many of these should I get to get to six? What times two makes six? There you go. Wow, that's it. That worked. So, this, is, this brings you through a lot of things. It's great practice for you because A, it, it reminds you back to the original when we started talking about how ionic things form and you get the charges right. Correct? We're also kind of incorporating this balancing. But we still don't know if this is a reaction or not. That's what we're doing today. This could be something. It may be nothing. We're about to find out. You ready? So you start doing this and then the question is, is either one of these insoluble? If so, there's a reaction. If both of these remain soluble, i.e. dissolved in water, then nothing happened. Okay, so let's find out how to read the table. Okay, you ready? Enough of that. Got it, got the theory, got it, got it, got it. Let's see how to read this table. Now, I'm just, I just show you half a minute. It's, if you wanted to know how to do this table kind of quickly in your head, I told you minus one stuff, plus one stuff is usually soluble. So I always look at the anions. I always look at the anion. That's a minus one anion. That's a minus two anion. That's a minus one anion. That's a minus two anion. This is probably soluble. This is probably insoluble. That's just your quick rule of thumb. There's only two exceptions to that rule of thumb. One of those, any of these minus ones are usually soluble except for the hydroxide. Any of the minus two minus threes are soluble except for the sulfates. And that's it. But you don't, that's just, you don't have to know that. You'll have the table in front of you. Um, I saw your, these are all minus two and minus three, agreed? Are insoluble, or insoluble? Yeah, insoluble. They fall out. The only exception is up here in the sulfates. So now look at your table, and you can write on your table if you want. Look at the top part. Make sure you understand the top part. Are, these are the soluble things. In fact, you would say, hey, if anything has lithium, sodium, potassium, whatever, it just, it's soluble. So the minute I see, you know, Soluble, it's done. See it? That's what that's trying to say. 
But I work off the anions. I work off the anions. So that's the way I work. Okay. So let's just do this one. I'm going to do this one. You ready? Sodium nitrate. I'm going to look at the nitrates. And I go, aha, where are the nitrates? I know you're on here. There you are. They're all soluble with no exceptions. Aha. This thing has to be soluble. I'm going to put an AQ on there. Everybody see how I did it? I looked for the nitrates. Which is right there. I look if there's any exception, and there is not. So therefore, anything with a nitrate attached is soluble. I can make it obvious. That's no reaction at this point. I go to the sulfates. I go, oh, almost all the sulfates are soluble except for these cations. Is iron one of those? Nope. So this thing is soluble. That's no reaction. Nothing happened. So if sulfate was paired with calcium? Yep. It would precipitate. Yeah, here we'll try another one. You ready? It would precipitate. Yep. Let's do the next one. You'll get you guys feel for it. Chlorides. Look up there and find them. Right there. UC soluble is sodium an exception. No. So this thing's just an aqueous, but we knew that's table salt. No good there. Carbonates. Ooh, these are usually insoluble. Unless they're containing alkali metal ions and ammonium. Ooh, for you got a table here. Some of you may not know alkali metals, that's group one. That's the sodium family. And calcium's not in that family. So this happens to be right? Insoluble. So this is, there's your reaction. If I put these two together, I get a powder in there. And I know that's true because that's how you make chalk. So that's how you make chalk. That's chalk. Calcium carbonate. Okay. If you're a KU fan like me, you're very sad because of the March Madness, but you're also reminded that the campus is built on a chalk hill. That's why we say rock chalk Jayhawk. In case you ever hear that saying, you're like, what is wrong with these people? They're chanting some sort of weird gibberish. It's because the hill is built on chalk. N not like they poured chalk out and built the campus, like it naturally is chalk. And the hill's very famous because during the uh, slavery, there was a signal on that hill that said it's safe to come in to this free state of Kansas from Missouri. So it's a very famous hill. So it's very, yeah, it's kind of a cool little story, right? In my opinion. Yes? Ammonium was added to the bottom soluble exceptions for hydroxides. Do we need to make sure? Ammonium is the very last thing. It was yeah, just so added. ammonium is NH4. Yeah. We don't have it on our sheet. We just don't have it on our sheet. Oh, you don't have it. Oh, my. Yeah, write that on there. Let's just write it on as is. You can say, I'm sorry, this thing's about to get fired. Oh, yeah, that guy is from Kansas. Let's see how this works. Put this on there. Thank you. That's a Moni Young. Wow, good catch. And then the alkali metals, that would be that lithium, right, the lithium family. You know, you don't have to write them down, but you know, lithium, sodium, blah, blah, blah. That, that's what they mean when they say alkaline minerals. Cool. Okay, we're going to practice. We'll get, we'll get, kind of get that. So these are just, that was if you're trying to memorize that, you could... This is just something I teach chemistry students. So they kind of have it quickly in their head and they go, hey, if it's minus two, minus three, it's probably insoluble unless it's a sulfate. If it's minus one, it's probably soluble unless it's a hydroxide. Right? It's just a quick memorization of that table. All right, let's try one, shall we? We got potassium iodide and magnesium sulfate. So we're about to figure out, you guys agree with how I switched it? 
Magnesium for potassium, is this correct? Magnesium iodide. Now why did I have to put two on here? Magnesium has what kind of charge on it? Two, right? So I had to have two iodines on there, okay? All right, so then this is potassium sulfate. And again, sulfate's two minus, so I had to have two potassiums. I actually balanced this one out for you already. But the question is, is it, do I get an insoluble piece? You ready? You're gonna track the iodine down? Hanging out here. Is magnesium an exception? No. Nope, so this thing would be Soluble, so that nothing, no reaction yet, correct? So this would just be aqueous, agreed? Ooh, there's a sulfate, probably insoluble, unless potassium is an exception, is it? No, no reaction. Is that okay? Now we're going to practice some, so get your chart out, and we're going to have you guys kind of decide, but the, the beauty of this, and this is why it's a little late to class, because I thought, I'll just let, we'll decide, you'll show me what you think, and then we'll just do it and see if you're right. So that way you can kind of appreciate the precipitation. Does that sound good? All right. So we got three of them. Um, this will be great, because you guys can all practice switching ions. Deciding whether one of them is soluble or not, if it's soluble, and, and if you get two insolubles, just put no reaction. All right? So here we go. We're going to set this one up over here. Carbonate. Bearing chloride. Awesome. We'll have you guys do the spring break trip trip now. Because usually I have you guys work over here by if you work on that one down there. Okay? So you know, use six and take that whole thing down there. See what you think. And then not very much room to work. Maybe we can do this. Perfect. We'll do we'll do you five. And you can work on this middle one. Sodium chloride plus magnesium sulfate. Ooh. That's the worst S I've ever drawn. There you go. there's no reaction, go ahead and balance the reaction because that would be good practice for you guys. All right. And then the middle group, you guys can do this bottom reaction.
I got as far as you guys do. Yeah, 
together. And do you think we're going to come with it? Yeah. It makes the school yeah. tune in a way because they go like this. Yeah. So that looks good. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. how you balance. So like little, and you can check theirs too. Like you just did that balancing, see if they balance theirs correctly. Yeah. Yeah. there because barium so has two chlorides in that. If it was just by itself, like, and then on the... Here, here, let me show you one. If it was by itself, though, on the product side, would you still carry over that, too? Um, um, let's just say we do something like, we do some decomposition reaction and get it. Like that? Is that what you're saying? You just you made that guy, this guy kind of get all his things right. And then you have to make this balance out, so that... Here that is. This is how it would look, right? Now when I go to balance it, I gotta make that correct. So bottom line is these are determined by the proper structure. This is determined by making sure the atom count sums up at the end. It's what they call the balanced equation of stoichiometry. So cool. All right, we got this last one. You guys ready? Let's see what's that. So you're going to have to work, the carbonate is a two, so that goes there. The iron has what kind of charge? You might have to work the front part out. What was the charge in the iron here? Two. Well, remember how this lower number? It was a piece of three. Yeah, it was an iron three. So this one you get over here is an iron three. So you write a three here. Everybody tried this last one. It's tough. It is tough. You gotta you gotta think about the charge originally. The charges don't change by the way. What is the charge on iron to start with? Iron three. So when I get over there, it's still iron three. That doesn't go away. Still iron three when it gets to this side. If this starts up, and this is so so it's always plus one. That, that's one thing to remember. If it's a pop, if it's a transition metal, if this is iron three here, it's iron three. Here. Okay. Yes. So with this one, when I just put it like that, yeah, you're on your way. Let's just get the compound built first, and these are the correct. That's the correct compound. That's what we want to start with. Great. Right. So okay. Let's here. Let's do this together, you guys, and just get me started. What did you say should cross over? What, give me what you started with. I had sodium. Sodium and? Um, nitrate. Nitrate. You guys agree with that? Yeah. Now we're going to, let's figure out the charge now, okay? Yeah. Sodium has what kind of charge on it? Plus one. Plus one. What's the charge on the nitrate? Negative one. How much? Minus one. Minus one. So isn't this formula correct? Don't worry about yeah. balancing yet. Uh, just do okay. one thing at a time. So okay. you don't carry over the two. You not yet. Just wait. Wait for it. Just get that right because that is correct now. Now let's go get the other one right. Okay, what's the other piece? Iron. Iron and cobalt. And that that's a carbonate. Carbonate. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Now again, I don't know. I'm gonna 
I'm going to bounce up here and just remember what was the charge on the iron here? Three. Does everybody see that? I don't. I don't know the charge on iron except I pay attention to this. That was three, so that was three. I remember how that cleaves us in. So now let's talk about carbonate. What's the charge on it according to the table? Two. Two minus. Okay. Now, now we can get the formula right. What number should go here? Two. Two. Remember that cross and drop. And then this thing should have a three. So far, so good. So hard. Yeah. Now we have to get the balancing right. But this, you start with the right formula. Now we're going to balance it. You ready? How's my irons? Two. Uh, not enough, right? So I've got to make more of them. i got to put two. And I don't change the formula because that's correct. Okay? I'm not going to mess with that. All right. How's my nitrates now? That's six nitrates. How many do I have over there? No, that's a single nitrate. Yeah, I only have one, and I need three, three so I just go over and drop a three in front. Then I restart. Let's see how we're doing. Two irons. Good. Six nitrates. I didn't get that right. I got three nitrates, right? I'm still not right. I got to get this all the way up to six. Hard one. There we go. Better? Because there's three times two, that's six of these total, and there's six over there, correct? All right. Now I get up here to the sodium, so I'm like, whoa, that's six. This is, so I should put a three in front. And the carbonates are okay. This is a harder, that's a harder balance than but let me remind you while you're practicing this, get your metal charge from this side. However it was built, whatever the structure was, that's the structure. That stuff's orange. I, there's another iron. Uh, there's an iron 2 nitrate. It's a, green, it's a green solution. It's an iron 2 nitrate. Right? This totally different problem. But if I did the same problem with that, it would start out like this. And you go, oh, that's a totally different thing than that. And if I set up the same problem with it, just so you guys can practice, I'm going to just walk it through. I go, okay, well, sodium nitrate, nothing new here. But now I've got carbonate and iron are one to one. Oh, cool. Right? Iron two. Iron two. That's. Correct? Correct? So now I just balance it. So let's start on the left. How are my irons? Good. How's my nitrates? It's two nitrates. Need a two. Fix that. Iron's good, nitrate's good. How are my sodiums? Good. How's my carbonates? Oh yeah, that's done. It's, that's how this works, the process. So when you first bring the change, you swap the metals and you start making the formula on the right side, you just balance those immediately. You right? make the right structure. Right. Yes. So you don't, you're not necessarily bringing over the numbers. You're no, just I'm making not. sure the charges are correct. Yes. It makes sense. I, yes, because I can't balance until I get my formulas correct. If I, right? Good stuff? practice. You'll do a few of them and it'll start to catch. You'll have to do a few. A couple of these trade-offs. Okay, now let's get, let's do the fun part before we take a break. Let's see. What do you guys think over there according to your sodium carbonate? That's the first one, right? Barium chloride. What do you think is going to happen? Reaction or not? Yeah. Yeah, so that, just so you see what that looks like. Woo! I'll just put a little bit in here. And yeah, it's a party. All right, here we go. Pretty good reaction. Oh, cool. That's the stuff. That's a precipitate, right? 
It's kind of cool, huh? All right, so there's that. One down. We're going to use the sodium again, right? You guys ready for this one? Is that next? Sodium chloride, magnesium sulfate? Okay, sodium chloride, magnesium sulfate. What do you think is going to happen? Oh, yeah. Nothing. Sodium chloride, by the way, is table salt. You're familiar with that. Anybody know mag sulfate? That's Epsom salt. So that's like you go soaking in that after a big hard day. So we think they're all pretty soluble. Oh, yeah. No reaction. Right? Okay, cool. And the last one, the hard one we just did, we, we went through all that. We've never have analyzed it, though, have we? Let's go take a look at your table. What do you guys think about sodium nitrate? Soluble. Cool. So what symbol should be here? Thank you. Thank you. What about iron carbonate? Mm -hmm. Solid. Oh, cool. So this should make a little precipitate. Right? Okay. Let's see. Sodium carbonate and iron. There we go. See what happens. Make a liar out of me, right? Oh, yeah. And this is kind of cool. I'll do this a little bit because, because it's colored, it's kind of fun to get the idea. This is how water treatment works. You add a carbonate, for example. And then I'll let you take a break. When you get back, you'll see that iron just settles out and you have the clear fluid on top. Hopefully. Can you point out where the FeCO3 became? became soluble. I see, I see carbonate on the paper, but... Oh, how, how it became where, insoluble? Yes, yes. Okay, so you go to carbonate, right. and this is on the insoluble side, mm -hmm. so anything down here should usually fall out. Okay. And the only reason that oh, we wanted see. if iron was an exception, but... Oh, okay, not. so it's reversed in the... Yep. Okay, I get it. Yep. So by catching that, the bottom part's the fallout, the yeah. precipitating ones, the top part's the aqueous, stay in solution. Cool. Take a break. Get in there. So it would be good. This is good review for you, though, because if you start, like you start thinking about these ionic compounds, because we did them a while back. While you're doing it, I would think about how you name them since you're in the neighborhood, because you got to get ready for your final exam, right? And I find that this is probably the hardest thing to kind of reflect back on is like, how do you name ionic compounds? Then also how you match the charge up, right? And so the keys the keys to that are anytime it's a transition metal, I don't know the charge until I look I look at what it's attached to. It's always the secret sauce, right? Alright. So anyway, you guys did good on this. Learned how to balance. Somebody was getting a little crazy with their PowerPoint, but alright, here's another one. This is kind of obvious right if I had some bigger molecule and it just fell apart that's called a decomposition reaction but again be aware that it could fall into things that are small molecules in fact here's a great one right this was a compound these are actually atoms from off the table they're diatomics so when I have things decomposing decomp into individual atoms I, I call that decomposition so Here's one decomposition that's a little harder to see, I think. Right, I basically have a very complicated carbon with three oxygens. I end up with carbon with two oxygens. Okay, so that would be another way to think about it. This water just coming apart into its fundamental elements. And I'm just getting, these would be great. These are good, good practice for you. All right. Then I'm going to show you an acid-base reaction. This is very relevant to you, your, your field because a lot of what you do is acid-base chemistry in the mouth, mouth. And I want you to know that fundamentally, whenever an acid hits a base, you get water and salt. Okay? And then we'll spend a minute because you might be looking at that going, well, I kind of know what acids are. I'm not quite sure. And then bases, you probably, does anybody know what a base is right off the top of their head? 
I can get you there pretty quick. It's hydroxide. It's actually the, the anion, the hydroxide anion is considered basic in water. Okay? And we'll get into that a little bit more, but that'll get you going. So, acids, and I'll start you off now and then I'll, I'll just reinforce this. When you have a leading H, those are considered acids. Now sometimes, you have things that are like this, and you have a leading H, but you have other H's hidden in the interior. That's your good clue. Oh wow, this is an acid, and if so, this is the only acidic part of it. Okay, we're going to revisit that, but that'll help you a little bit. So, instead of sticking all the H's together, right, they purposely put an H in front. What does that mean? Oh, they're trying to tell you it's an acid. They're trying to signal it's an acid. Now, there's one exception to this, but I bet everybody knows this. You know that that's not an acid, right? You look at that and go, oh, wait, that's just water. But most anything else I wrote, if I let off with an H, I'm, I'm trying to warn you that this is some sort of acid. Now, the other thing that will really identify it is that H in an acid is connected to a polyatomic ion or it's connected to an anion. So anytime I get up here and I go, okay, here's H2S, ah, probably acidic. Now, here's a non-acidic one. But that's okay because it doesn't lead with the H, so I want to be suckered in and go, oh, that's an acid, right? Does that make sense? So H2S, HCl, if it connects to a polyatomic ion, it's an acid. But again, watch out for these. Just ignore these. These aren't telling you anything. This is an H. That's an acid. All right? But what we know is this. If that acid connects with the base, any kind of hydroxide, I'm going to make salt and water, and that's how it gets rid of it. Both of these things are hard. Like, for example, this is muriatic acid. This is literally shoot concrete off the sidewalk, right? This is oven cleaner. These are nasty, nasty, right? If I put any of those on my tongue, I'd have a big hole in my tongue, correct? But when I'm done, look what I make. Table salt water. I can literally drink it. So that's what's called a neutralization reaction. That's one you should know, because you're, you're going to be doing that a lot. Like, we do things, right? We go, OK, we think bacteria makes acid in our mouth. That's what kind of leads to the cavity environment. So sometimes we use like a basic toothpaste, like something with baking soda in it. Here's another example. Everybody OK see the leading H? There's the hydroxide. Now, all you have to do to figure out what your products are is you, you do kind of a double displacement again. Attach that metal to the anion. Oh, okay, that's lithium sulfate. And then the H, the OH and the H, that's what makes the water. So you can kind of do the same thing where you're just switching them. That's what makes the water and then lithium sulfate. So that's another skill set I think comes out of here that could be challenging sometimes. All right, so we'll talk about that. Maybe, maybe we'll, let's get a couple of products down real quick, just so you guys can practice that, so you're used to it. Okay, and I don't. I, I'm not going to write them in different orders, just so you can kind of see. It's not always the same. So if I said, all right, I'm going to take sodium hydroxide. And I'll put it with this stuff. Okay? That's your nitrate anion, right? Acid on the right or the left? The right, agreed? The base is on the left, agreed? All right. Do your switch. I'm going to make. Who can name the salt? Sodium. So here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the trade. This goes here, and that goes there, right? So when that sodium's in there, what is that stuff called? 
I'm trained, right? And then the other part is? Don't overthink that. It's always the same thing, always water. Then you'll balance it out. You'll see where everything went once you balance it. Shall we try balancing? Okay. This is these are sometimes harder, but that it's easy when you kind of think about this. That's H two O. That's water. That's taken care of in sodium nitrate. So we're good. It's good. Okay, it might come at you in this direction. Where's the acid? Left. Where's the base? Right? What's the salt that I'm making? Calcium, salt, fate. And then I back up and I just remember I can eat practice this, this, right? Calcium's what root? Two, so the charge on it is. Sulfate has what kind of charge on it? By the way, did you notice the polyatomic ion charges are on your precipitation sheet? What's the charge on this? Okay, is this the right formula then? Yeah, it ended up being two to two, right? But that just reduces down, so we're good. Now we go over and make the other thing, which is water. And then we start talking about how we balance this. Hmm. Calcium sulfate's all right. What about the waters? How many waters are there? Sometimes it helps to work off this as the source of your oxygen. How many oxygens are in here? Two. So do that over here. That'll help you. Now, how's my hydrogens holding up? Two hydrogens, four hydrogens, four hydrogens. Good stuff. Got it? That's a precipitate or a uh, neutralization reaction. Which I, we're going to just generally call an acid base reaction. That all right? All right. Let's spend a minute and talk about stuff, acids, bases, a little bit. Why do we care? Like, why do we care if something's acidic or basic? Well, let's begin with the stuff you guys need to know, right? The acidic environment in your mouth is what leads to cavities. So that's why we care about that. Basic environment will prevent that from happening. Um, it's also fairly well known that acids are able to dissolve metals. So anytime an acid, if you have an acidic environment around a metal, it'll just make that metal go into solution. So if this was the frame of your car, and there was acid on it, it would literally turn to a salt. That would not be good for you. Right? And that happens to a lot of vehicles that are sitting on the coast that get around like this city get wet environments all the time and you start to see the frames rust out. Right? In Colorado you see this going down the highway every once in a while. Right? You see these metal that metal has been solubilized, it's coming down the side of the mountains, the mountains look kind of colored. You're like, oh my gosh, that's that's acid working on the metal, the iron tailings, or other metals. It makes redox chemistry happen. This may not mean anything to you, but the basic bottom line is, is that um, one of these, by the way, the only metals that won't react with acids are the precious metals. That's why they're precious, right? If so if I drop this gold in acid, it wouldn't do anything. Copper's precious enough, it won't react. But if you put an acid around here, like, so what my point is is this, copper wouldn't react with acid, nitrates wouldn't react with acid, not that you would know this reaction, but in the presence of both acid and copper, you get this wild reaction. And if I had a hood, I could show this one to you, because it's pretty spectacular. You might figure this out, but basically it'll just destroy a penny, right? You put nitric acid on it and it'll just chew it completely up. So that's a pretty good reaction. All right, so let's talk about, we're gonna talk about acids. What I'd like to do is just make sure you identify them, which I think you're getting there, right? Leads with an H. We're gonna know how to name them. And then we're gonna know a little bit about what it means when we say weak or strong acids. Know the difference. And I'll just kind of give you a sense for what's weak and what's strong. All right, so first off, 
If you think about a strong acid, what it means is when you drop it in water, it completely disassociates and this is the acid form. So let's get this out of the way. H plus in water is what acid is. Hydroxide in water, that's what base is. We call this an acid, but it's not really an acid until it's water and it disassociates and that's the business in that H plus. We might remember why. How many protons on hydrogen? One. Good. Now, if I had a plus one charge, how many electrons would it have? Zero. Zero. So it literally is a proton floating around in water. It's a small positive charge. So it will rip electrons off of anything. That's why an acid is an acid. So now an acid comes near a metal, which is a loser. Remember we talked about these guys? They all like to lose electrons. They're wimpy. Acid comes near that, i.e. the H+, plus, it rips the electrons off of it. And that's why it's so dangerous. Now, if you say something strong, that means when you drop it in water, it completely breaks in half, and this is all you get. All right? Now, if I looked at that in water, can you see that picture? It's kind of a little bright over there. You guys can turn it off. Turn that off. Can you see that little? Okay. So when HCl drops in water, it doesn't stay together, right? It falls apart. That's what it's going to do, and that's what creates all this acid in there. So that's what a strong acid looks like. If you got the model in your head. If I say it's something strong, then it's going to be mostly all disassociated, all broken in half. And you have lots of this floating around in there. Is that okay? So that's why ACL is such a vicious acid and it would basically, you know. And another way I look at it, based on what you guys just did solution-wise, a 0.1 molar, that's how many? Help me understand that. What's big M mean? Moles per? One liter. One liter, right? <laughs> so that means if I had a 0.1 molar of HCl, that means I would have 0.1 moles of H+, because they all fall apart. Right? It's 100% ionized. A weak acid, so interesting enough, look, this looks the same family. See, HCl, now it's HF. This one's weak. What does it mean? It means it stays together when you drop <coughs> it in water. Very little of it falls apart. So if I looked at the model, it would look like this. No, it doesn't fall apart. So there's no H plus in the water, so that the acid isn't really changing much. Except on occasion, so I'm going to put a few of these in here, a small amount of them falls apart. Okay? Now, if you're in chemistry too, we learn exactly how much of that falls apart. It's a pretty complicated equation. But for you guys, it's very straightforward. You go, hey, this thing's weak. I get very little H+. Let me give you an example of this. So vinegar is a weak acid. You guys familiar with that? That's acetic acid. Actually, that's this guy right here. That's this. This is it. It's a weak acid. So when I take vinegar, I take a spoonful of it and I or I put it on my wings, or I do whatever, and it's got a little bit of bite, right? No big deal, because there's just a few of these H pluses around, and that doesn't hurt me. But if I took HCl and put it on a spoon, if it didn't eat the spoon, it would chew up my tongue, right? So it's like, because it would completely break apart, and all those H pluses would be available. So weak means very little disassociation, right? And just to put it in perspective, this calculation's done nothing you'll learn to do in here, but if I had a 0.1 molar solution of HF, it would only be, that's a tenth, right? Tenth of a mole, only six one thousandths of a mole would be dissolved as H+. The rest of it would stay together. And that's what weak means. 
And for you guys, all you need to know, if we say it's weak, the concentration of the acid is much less, the H pluses is much less than the H, the acid I put in there. That's all you need to know. Just so you kind of put it in perspective, it's 0.6% ionized, not 100%. Is that all right? Now, I'm going to show you how to identify them by looking, and then we're going to name them. That's kind of what we're going to try and end up. We'll see how we do today. How are we doing? I'll get some time. Cool. I got another uh, demo, but it has to do with the next thing. We'll see how we do. You guys ready? So, acids could be H attached to something over there on the periodic table. I'm going to show you how to identify the strong ones. It's very simple. If the H is attached to these three things right here, it's strong. Chlorine bromine iodine. If the H is attached to anything else, it's weak. That's it. HCl, strong. HTE or H2TE, weak. HF, weak. H2S, weak. See, it's just all, only these guys. HCl, HBr, HI, those are strong acids. Everything else is a weak acid. That's pretty easy, right? Cool. So those are the strongs. Now, the other thing is, if I think about the anion, I can attach the right number of protons to it. So that, again, kind of reviews with you guys again, right? So I'm going to make one out of sulfur. I'm going to attach H pluses to this. So you guys walk me through the process. First off, what charge does sulfur like to take? Minus 2, excellent. Based on that, how many H's should it attach? This is a 1 plus, that's a 2 minus. That is correct. That is the correct formula for this. This is what they call sour gas. This is the stuff that shows up in oil refineries. It's highly, highly toxic. Kind of stuff if you breathe it, you go down. Fast. Yeah, I love that, right? Sulfur and acid are bad mix. Now, Let's talk about how to name it. I always say you name acids. Have we talked about this in here at all? We name those off of there. You start with the word hydro. That clues you in that the H is attached to something over there on the table. You now attach the anion, hydrosulfur, right? And then I put an ick on it, so I call it hydroicky acid. That's what I do sometimes on that. Let me just see if I can get that picture up. I don't have that picture up because I was going to help you with that. So, the naming looks like this. And we'll get back to that, I'm sure. Hydro. Just put the anion in there. And then you just change ick in there, and then you throw in the word acid. Okay? So, hydro sulfuric acid. Hydrobromic acid. Hydro hydroiodic acid. Try one of these. What's the charge on this? Two minus, correct? So how many H's should I attach? Two, and then I'm ready to name it. Hydro toluric acid. Yep, that's it. Hydrosulfuric acid. How would you name this one? Hydrofluoric acid, right? Easy enough. Here's the weaks, here's the strongs. Now I'm going to show you another thing that's unique, and I just say this to you guys because in your field it might come up. There's a, a weird thing about um, 
first row transition metals and aluminum also make water slightly acidic, and that's a kind of a complicated thing, but I'm just going to show you where it sits, just so you know. Any of these metals, it's a trend, so that's kind of nice. Any of these metals and aluminum, and they're salts, they make water slightly acidic. So if I did something that had iron in your mouth, it could make your mouth a little bit acidic. If I put aluminum in your mouth, it's going to make your mouth a little acidic. That's probably why those materials are not used, right? Unless they're compounded with something that's a, uh, more of a noble metal. Does that make sense? Now, I'm going to show you how that happens. It's kind of complicated, but just so you know, just like you're sitting there going, I've got aluminum, why is it making an H plus, correct? Like, where did it come from? It comes from water. Aluminum hooks on to five waters. It's really kind of wild. And then it hooks on to a six, and on that six water, it breaks off at H plus. It makes this thing. So really, it's six waters total, there's five. See it? The fifth one is broken and the H plus came off of it. And that's what, that's the same mechanism for all these things. And so the way to think about it is, you might be going like, okay, why does it do that? Well, remember what a hydrogen bomb kind of looks like? The electrons shift. So they're kind of shifting like this anyway, towards the oxygen, which is weakening the bond, right? But when I plug it into a, an aluminum, it plugs in kind of like this. So that attaches to the aluminum. That's already got a plus charge. So I know that that electron's shifting already there, but it even shifts more because of that plus charge. So basically, all together, that creates a loose enough bond. One of these pops off. And I'll just leave it at that. It involves five other waters in order for the effect to happen. But. The nice thing for you is it's just simple trend. It's just like, look, anytime I have these particular metals in, in a salt, not just the metal drop, like I take an iron wire drop in water, it doesn't make the water acidic. But if it's an iron salt like this stuff, this stuff, oh yeah, now it's starting to clean up. Can you see the clean water on top? Can I see the cleaner film on top? Prior to this happening, when that iron was suspended in water, the water was acidic. Okay? All right, so there's that. And then I'm just trying to show you that. I simplified the reaction. I kind of, here's how I simplify it down so it's easier to understand. I say, imagine that you cleaved off one of these H's and left the OH attached to the iron. That's where the H plus came from, one of the waters. That's kind of the way to do that. That's just very simple. All right. And that's why if you put iron, like you have an iron salt in water, it makes the water acidic. The acidic water dissolves more iron, makes it more acidic, and then you get this loop, and that's where you get into these abandoned mines that drain off these acidic waters. Okay. Now, lean H combined with a polyatomic ion is called an oxo added, and, and the naming's a little different for this. So, these are the other acids, all your polyatomic ions. So get your sheet out, if you have a polyatomic ion sheet. Any one of those anions could attach H's to it and become an acid. So pick one of the polyatomic ions. Anybody. What? Carbonate. Good. You ready? I'm going to take carbonate. How many H's would attach? Two. There's the acid. And now I'm going to tell you how to name this. You ready? No hydro on this. This is the clue. Never to leave with the hydro. Okay, let me see if I got the thing in there. I'm going to see. Okay, we're just practicing. Um, the way I remember this is if you have a grandma that's from the south. Anybody have a grandma from the south? Okay, good. 
And she was afraid of addicts. She might have a condition called adicitis. She'd be like, I got adicitis. I'm afraid of the addict. Right? Adicitis. Okay. <laughs> Go with it. Adicitis. You ready? So that was called the carbonate. Correct? So I'm going to put the polyatomic ion name over on this side, and then I'm going to put the acid. If it came from an 8, we change the name to an 8. Eighty. Sorry. Ick. There you go. Eightic. Eight us. Yeah, and then this is the acid name. So, instead of calling it carbonate, I call it carbonic acid. Ready? Let's check the charge on this. I'm trying to build these so you practice this. So, imagine the H's are off. Just take the H's off for a second. There we go. I just put one on, but ignore it for a second. How many H's should attach to sulfate to be correct? Two. Two. Is that right? You ready to name it? That's a sulfate. Yep. So we call it sulfuric acid. Okay? Sulfuric acid. I don't know why I put the H on there, but how many should I attach to this thing? So fight. Two. That looks correct now. That came from here. So I call it sulfur S acid. Adicitis. That's how you name all of those. No hydro. So I know, oh, it's Paul Tom again. Eight polyatomic ions become I, or ick, eight ick. I become us. Um, okay, so we'll now call, this came from sulfide, right? So it'll be sulfur us acid. Now I'm getting, I don't know why I got it. Oh, I, I am slow on the experiment. You'll see it there in a minute. Now, here's how you can tell weak plus strong. Here's how you do weak plus strong. It's called the H plus 1 rule. Okay? What you do is you do this. See how many H's I have? Add 1 to it. What do you get? 3. Compare that to the number of O's. And if it's less, it's strong. If it's equal to or greater than, it's weak. All right. H plus 1 is 3, that's less than the number of O's, it's strong. H plus 1 is? 2 plus 1 is? 3. Compared to the number of O's, it's the same, it's weak. Let's go do your carbonic. H plus 1 is 3. Oh, that's a weak acid. And that's true. Carbonic acid is the acid that you drink when you drink soda. And it's not very strong, right? Because when you drink soda, it's not like all of a sudden it starts burning through your, right? It, but you can, it, if you let it sit there long enough, it is hard on your teeth, right? Make sense? Okay. This will, I see people packing up because it's time to go. All right. So this is where we'll pick up. We'll kind of finish this out. And we'll do some acid base chemistry when we get back and we'll, we'll move on. We'll finish slides 04. Where is this? 04? When we get back. You can start practice.